Hello, good afternoon and good evening from wherever you're joining us today. Thank you for attending. My name is Valeria Rumori and I'm the director of the Italian Culture Institute in Los Angeles. I'm truly delighted to present this online conversation, Fellini Forever, exploring the iconic director's filmography. This webinar is part of the official celebrations for the Federico Fellini Centennial, organized worldwide throughout 2020 by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And it's presented on the occasion of the 20th edition of the Italian Language in the World Week. The Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles will present future Fellini events, including the exclusive photography exhibit, Fellini in Action, eight and a half set photography of Paul Ronald, and in December, in the month of December. And so we'd like you to stay tuned for more, for updates and more information. We're honored to begin this event with opening remarks from the Consul General of Italy in Houston, Federico Ciattaglia. We are also very fortunate to have our expert panelist, Alessandro Carrera, Professor of Italian Studies and World Cultures and Literatures at the University of Houston, Anya O'Healy, Professor of Italian at Loyola Marymount University, Thomas Harrison, Professor at UCLA Department of Italian. I would sincerely like to extend my gratitude to all these evening participants for their invaluable collaboration in making this event possible. The event format will be, will begin with remarks by Consul General Chattaglia. Next, Professor Harrison will introduce the panelists and after the presentations, there will be a Q&A with the public. Please use the Q&A section of Zoom to ask your questions. Professor Harrison teaches Italian film at the graduate and undergraduate levels, as well as modern and contemporary culture and literature. Author of the forthcoming of Bridges, a poetic and philosophical account with the University of Chicago Press in 2021, he has also written a number of books and essays on poetry, philosophy, cultural aesthetics, and comparative arts. Thanks again to our distinguished guests, Alessandro Carrera, Anya O'Ealy, Tom Harrison. And now, without any further ado, it is my honor to introduce the Consul General of Italy in Houston, Federico Ciattaglia. Thank you, Director uh, Rumori. Uh, thank you uh, for this kind introduction. Good evening to everybody. Uh, honestly, I'm very, I'm very happy. I'm very glad to be here with you tonight because it's uh, really uh, interesting. Uh, tonight, uh, as Consulate General of Italy in Houston, we open the Italian uh, week language with this uh, very, very uh, full uh, uh, a webinar on Federico Fellini. The events we will uh, promote during these days, during the coming days, are mostly upon the uh, um, Federico Fellini uh, logo, I would say, as well as uh, another uh, very important topic, comics, uh, which is the topic of the Italian Language Week uh, uh, this year. Uh, so uh, I really would like to uh, ask to everybody to stay tuned to, to follow us as well as the uh, Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles uh, to be updated uh, for uh, on on our upcoming events. And uh, I really thank again uh, Professor O'Ealy, Professor Carrera, Professor Harrison for this kind contribution uh, tonight. Uh, I know that their intervention will be very very. Uh, fruitful. Now uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to Professor Harrison for uh, its introduction. Its introduction. Thank you so much and good day. Thank you, Consul General. Thank you, uh, Direttrice in Los Angeles, very much for this uh, evening. It's a pleasure to be able to celebrate Fellini once again. He cannot be celebrated enough, and this is the year to do so. 
Our first speaker will be Alessandro Carrera, John and Rebecca Moore's Professor of Italian Studies and World Cultures and Literatures at the University of Houston, Texas. He has published extensively on Italian and comparative literature, continental philosophy, classical and popular music, and contemporary art. He has written on Roberto Rossellini and is the author of Fellini's Eternal Rome, Paganism and Christianity in Federico Fellini's films. This wonderful, one of the most intelligent books written on Fellini of our time, published by Bloomsbury in 2019 and the winner of the Flaiano Prize for Italian Studies. Carrera has translated into Italian all the songs and prose of Bob Dylan, four novels of Graham Greene, and is currently working on the Italian edition of Andy Warhol's writings. He's going to speak to us for approximately 15 minutes on the topic of synchronicity or deep time in Fellini. Professor Carrera. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Consul General and uh, Director uh, Rumori for, for your introduction and for this wonderful, uh, wonderful opportunity to talk about, uh, about Fellini. Now, uh, the topic that I had chosen uh, may, may sound uh, a little mysterious, uh, you know, deep time or synchronicity, what it is that has to do with Fellini. Well, let me, let me say, uh, although this does not seem to, to be on topic, but it, in fact it is, that this week, uh, in this week uh, of the, dedicated to the Italian language, uh, there will be talks uh, and um, and uh, panels on comics. Well, Fellini was, uh, uh, first of all, a great lover of comics. Uh, and besides, he started his career as a caricaturist uh, and uh, as someone who drew comics uh, for the Marc Aurelio, which was a satirical uh, bi-weekly uh, magazine published in Rome in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that was incredibly successful in Italy at the time. So working uh, and started a career at the Marc Aurelio was in fact for others, not just Fellini, the first step to move on to cinema. They moved from comics to, to cinema. And this is what, in fact, what Fellini did. But the influence of comics on Fellini is deeper than that. In fact, uh, uh, if we look at the structure of uh, narrative structure of Fellini's films, uh, we see they did usually they do not follow the typical pattern uh, of the three act uh, formats uh, that you find uh, in Hollywood movies, but not just in Hollywood, in many, in many others. I mean, stories are not structured in three acts, but in different sequences. And sometimes there is a time gap between them, sometimes there isn't. But think, for example, of La Dolce Vita, you have a prologue, seven episodes and, and an epilogue. And uh, Fellini uh, got this idea, essentially from comics, from strips, to, to be precise, not from long narratives, but from strips. And in fact, when he made the Fellini Satiricon, which is one of the films I want to talk about right now, uh, he was fascinated with uh, that ancient Roman novel precisely because it has come to us in fragments. Uh, we have only a small part of what was the original narrative, which was very, very long. And we have mm, probably only one fifth of it, or maybe even less. And several fragments of, uh, of the novel. Well, uh, reading the fragments, uh, Fellini had the impression that he was reading strips, comic strips. And uh, he structured his film exactly the same way so that one sequence gets to another. It's not that one sequence gets to another by continuity. There may be a gap in the middle that you, and you don't know what happened in the middle because it's been lost or because the author didn't want to say or just because you missed uh, uh, one day in the newspaper so you missed the funnies. Well, uh, that brings me to uh, the idea that there is a, a deeper level of thinking about continuity and discontinuity, historical continuity and discontinuity in Fellini's films. You know, Fellini created a legend, a legend about him himself, uh, that he was uh, completely self-taught, which is a fact is true, and not particularly well, well learned, uh, not particularly well read. But that is not really true. Uh, as many 
people who are self-taught and many artists who are self-taught, they didn't want uh, other people to, to judge his level of education and they prefer to pass as uh, someone who knows basically nothing. But we know that he was an, actually a very avid reader and he read a lot of classics, uh, a lot of classics of antiquity and also models, I mean, from uh, Petronius, uh, Satyricon to, to Kafka, uh, which was one of his favorite, uh, favorite authors. And, uh, you know, the issue of uh, historical continuity or discontinuity is important to him because in uh, films uh, like La Dolce Vita, what you have is uh, um, synchronicity, we can use this term, of pagan Rome and Christian Rome. And then when he moves on to Fellini Satyricon, uh, eight years later, uh, what we have is the attempt to recreate uh, a Roman civilization as if uh, it went into an eternal decadence, uh, but never been replaced uh, by anything else. I mean, Fellini Satyricon does not even take place in Rome. It takes place in a Roman space, uh, which is very uncertain, it's, it's boundless. It has no boundaries, no boundaries in space and no boundaries in time. It's as if uh, Rome had uh, gone on and on in its uh, de uh, late decadence without ever being replaced by Christianity. Uh, but let's start with La Dolce Vita and the first uh, image the establishing shot of La Dolce Vita. What you see is a statue of Jesus Christ carried by a helicopter. Now, Fellini did not invent the whole thing because it actually happened. On May 1st, 1956, a statue of Jesus Christ was carried by helicopter from Milan to Rome uh, on the occasion of uh, the a new festivity, the festivity of uh, uh, St. Joseph the Laborer, which was the Catholic uh, answer to the labor festivity of May, May 1st, the Labor Day in the United States. Um, so Fellini got the idea from uh, the pictures on a newspaper of this helicopter carrying a statue of Christ to Rome. So what he did was to have two helicopters, a much bigger statue, because the original one was rather small, a much bigger statue that passes over, flies over uh, the aqueduct of uh, uh, Felice, the aqueduct Felice in Rome, and then um, flies until it reaches uh, the St. Peter's Cathedral. So what you have is Christ finally coming to Rome after 2000 years. The only thing is that uh, Christ will find that the church is already there. Um, so the ancient time and present times uh, collapse. And this idea of collapsing time is something that you find in Fellini over and over again. And there is another example from Fellini Satyricon, which I like to tell because uh, it, it kind of struck home to me the first time that I saw the, the movie and I was 18 years old. It's when uh, Encolpius, uh, one of the two main characters, uh, is being forced to challenge the Minotaur, the mythical creature, and the Minotaur is much stronger than he is. And so Encolpius is on the ground and he could be killed at any moment. Uh, and he tries to stop the Minotaur saying, uh, dear Minotaur, don't, don't kill me, I'm just a student. Now that line, I am, I'm just a student, uh, you know, re really made me jump on my seat because the year when I saw that film was 1972. And uh, you know, you could just leave the movie house and get out uh, in the streets of Milan and there were plenty of students uh, that were clubbed by minotaurs uh, with the police uniform on. So it was Roman, Roman past, it was mythical, but at the same time, it was uncannily present. And the same thing, the same thing happens in uh, uh, the third film of the Roman trilogy by Fellini. The first is La Dolce Vita, the second is Fellini Satyricon, and the third is Roma, 19, uh, 1972. 
Um, I'm talking here of the one of the most impressive uh, scene in, in the film. It's when uh, they are excavating uh, the, the subway in, in Rome, uh, a very long project uh, that, that started many years before. And there is this gigantic mold that is churning the ground and it ends up uh, um, piercing through a wall uh, of an ancient Roman house that has been entirely preserved uh, because it's still there intact. Uh, but now that the wall has been pierced by a mold, now the modern air gets in and corrodes all the paintings on the, on the walls. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful uh, sequences uh, shot by, by Fellini. But there is one little detail in that scene that I want to talk to you about because I think I'm the only one who noticed it. And I put it in my book, of course. You know, I, I, I've read anything I could possibly read about uh, about that film, and I found uh, no no reference to that little detail. The little detail is as follows: um, a few moments before the uh, the mole pierces the wall, there is one of the workers um, on on this side of the wall who uh, acts as if he were sick. You know, or, or as if he had a fever. You know, he starts uh, to, uh, touching his uh, his forehead. It seems that he had, has problem breathing. Uh, and in fact, uh, the other co-workers uh, are, are asking him, Amerigo, that's his name. Amerigo, what, what's going on with you? Are you sick? And he shakes his head uh, and he doesn't want to answer, but he moves away. He moves away. And at that moment, uh, we see the mold piercing, piercing the wall, and the uh, frescoes, the frescoes inside the house that's now being desecrated. And the first human figure that we see on the walls of that ancient Roman house is the exact copy of the worker who is outside. It's his painting, it's his portrait. And and then, and then uh, the, the whole thing disappeared. We do not see the worker anymore. We do not see that painting anymore. Well, so what's the meaning of that? It's a coincidence. It's uh, it's impossible that uh, Fellini, you know, overlooked that that detail. Of course, uh, that detail is there for a reason, but it's there for a reason that Fellini did not want to be too explicit about. It was there for us to discover, just like there are so many little details of that kind in Fellini after teaching so many courses on Fellini and seeing this film so many times, uh, you know, uh, this is not the only uncanny thing that I have discovered, there are, there are many others. But that one in particular means that there is a, an identity between uh, the Roman painting, uh, the that in ancient Roman painted on that wall and the worker who is outside, they are the same person. They are the same person. They live in a, a collapse of time, in deep time, as the geologists say. The deep time is when the geologist presses the ground with his or her boots and senses that the rock under under his feet are very, very, very old. So they have been there for millions of years, but at the same time, they are there in the present. They are, they are there in synchrony, in a synchronic time with, with, the, with the geologist. Well, this is a notion that has been picked up also by uh, scholars of, of classics. Uh, for example, this was Shane Butler who used the notion of deep time to explain uh, our uneasiness uh, toward antiquity because we think we know what antiquity is. But in fact, the, the deeper we go into what we know and uh, we have to come up with a conclusion that probably we don't know much about it, which was exactly the same thing that Fellini was saying when he was trying to explain what was the point of Fellini's satiricon. And he started from the point of view that we know nothing about Rome. Rome is as alien to us as Mars. 
uh, as alien to us as the word inhabited by Flash Gordon, another reference to comics. Now, of course, uh, this is not true because Rome is one of the most uh, documented uh, civilizations, ancient civilization in history. But if we think of the notion of deep time, and if we think that in fact, uh, the more we think we know, and maybe the less we actually know, we may say we may have the idea, we may come to the conclusion that Fellini was not entirely wrong in recreating Rome at the same time, knowing that it is really a lost world. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro, for an excellent talk about which we will raise questions later. And I remind the participants, there's some 150 of you, to put your questions into the Q&A section so that uh, we can look through them and then choose from among them. Um, we'll, we'll save the, the questions for Professor Carrera till, um, till the end. First, we'll have our second talk which is by Professor Anya Ohili. And um, Professor Ohili teaches Italian at Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles, where she coordinates the Italian program. She directs the LMU Summer in Rome program and currently chairs the Department of Classics and Archaeology. Over the past three decades, she has published very widely in Italian screen studies her most recent book is Migrant Anxieties, Italian Cinema in a Transnational Frame, published by the Indiana University Press in 2019. She has also published on transnational filmmaking, Irish cinema, feminist studies, and pedagogies of cinema. And she has served as co-editor of Palgrave's Global Cinema Book Series since its inception in 2010. Professor O'Healy is going to talk to us today about Fellini's projections of the feminine. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for your introduction. And uh, I'm grateful to the Istituto di Cultura for the possibility of, of uh, talking about Fellini. And very grateful to Alessandra Carrera, Alessandro Carrera for inviting me to be part of this event. Um, so, uh, I will from time to time glance at my notes because otherwise I won't remember all the points I wanted to make. My first encounter with Fellini's work happened in 1970 when I attended a screening of Amarcord not long after its release. The film struck me as one of the most extraordinary movies I'd ever seen, though it left me more than a little perplexed. In fact, Bellini's comic reinvention of the rhythms of daily life in a small provincial town during the height of the fascist era seemed both beguiling and absurd. Looking back, I believe my encounter with Amarcord was at least in part what prompted me, or what prompted my initial interest in pursuing film studies and eventually teaching film. Winner of the Oscar for Best Foreign Film in 1974, Amarcord tells a whimsical tale of male adolescence that unfolds in Fellini's native province sometime in the 1930s. Two things about the film made a memorable impression at first viewing. The enchantment of the townspeople with fascist spectacle and the parallel enchantment of almost all male characters with the women of the town presented as irresistible or disruptive creatures of compelling allure. The film's perspective is anchored by the 15-year-old schoolboy Tita, whom some critics have identified as a stand-in for the young maestro, although Fellini himself has claimed that the world of Amarcord is entirely fictional. Tita is part of a ragtag group of male adolescents who channel the film's anarchical libido <clears throat> and through whose vision all of the female characters come into view. The voluptuous Gradisca desired by all, the more slenderly proportioned Volpina, the town's prowling seductress, the local tobacconist looming large with fleshy intensity, and the middle-aged math teacher who swaggers her curvaceous form for the contemplation of her sex-obsessed students. What the film strongly suggests is that the citizens' fascination with women and their fascination with fascism are inflected by a distinctly adolescent worldview. Though clearly taking some critical distance from the world it constructs, the overall tone of the film is indulgent, even wistful and affectionate. 
What I didn't realize upon my first encounter with Amarcourt is that I was entering the Fellinian universe just past the midpoint of the director's career. I hadn't yet seen his highly acclaimed earlier films, Ivita Loni, La Strada, Nights of Cabiria, La Dolce Vita, and Eight and a Half. So I gradually worked my way back through this archive and thus discovered La Strada, Fellini's own favorite film, more than 20 years after its initial release. Starring Fellini's wife, Giulietta Mazzina, in the leading role, it tells the story of a naive young woman, half clown, half angel, abused and brutalized by the traveling strongman who purchases her from her impoverished family and takes her on the road. The film obviously has a transcendent poetic dimension, undeniably enhanced by the haunting music of Nino Rota, that seems to blunt the sadism we witness on the screen. In truth, I find it less watchable today than it might have been in the 1950s, long before the advent of the Me Too movement. Giulietta Mazzina appeared again uh, as the lead character in Knights of Cabiria, a naive and oddly asexual streetwalker whose dream of achieving love and conventional marriage is thwarted at every turn. A complex character combining both comic and tragic elements, Kabiriger remains, for me at least, a favorite among Fellini's female characters. But from now on, from this point onward, Fellini's women are no longer configured as a unique presence in the, at the center of a story. Instead, his films tend to conjure up a constellation of various female types who gravitate around a self-absorbed male character provoking his desire, but ultimately dodging his needs. Among the figures appearing in La Dolce Vita, Anita Ekberg is of course the most memorable, the voluptuous but elusive earth goddess who would reappear in subsequent Fellini's films, growing larger and more unsettling with each appearance. The director's next feature film, the iconic Eight and a Half, centers on the creative crisis of a filmmaker named Guido, whose unruly inner world shapes the entire narrative. Here we meet a bevy of variegated female archetypes belonging to different registers of Guido's consciousness, childhood recollections, contemporary experiences, fantasies, and dreams. Among these characters, another earth goddess of the sub-proletarian variety this time, emerges in the amply endowed figure of Saragina, a small time prostitute a, sorry, a small town prostitute who for a few coins will dance a rumba on the beach. Crucially, Saragina's exuberant performance is mediated through the gaze of a small boy, the childhood incarnation of the film's protagonist Guido, an obvious stand-in for Fellini himself. The whimsical realism of his earlier style that characterized his apparitions of the feminine became more frequent in his films. Yet there is an ironic self-awareness at work in Fellini's universe, since his larger than life and sometimes grotesque female figures are almost always linked to the immature perspective of an on-screen male presence thus foregrounding the cinematic construction of woman as a projection of male fantasy and desire. This approach, of course, allowed Fellini to have it both ways. In other words, to insinuate an apparent criticism of the masculinist biases of filmmaking practice, while indulging in some of the voyeuristic strategies he simultaneously exposed. Yet for many years, the Fellinian feminine, whether manifesting as goddess, muse, giantess, or crone, was shot through with a palpable affection. This would change, however, in the director's later work, where a different tonality begins to emerge. I'll now focus on the two final films of Fellini's career, Intervista, 1987, and The Voice of the Moon, 1989, which haven't been widely distributed outside Italy, but which offer some of the most complex constructions of femininity in all of the director's work, both films resonate with the anxieties of a filmmaker threatened by the proliferation of new technologies, changing social practices and cultural tastes. Intervista was produced to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of Cinecita and constitutes a highly idiosyncratic tribute to the studio where Fellini had spent most of his working life. 
a hybrid feature film, it could be described as a pseudo documentary in which Fellini plays a version of himself. Crucially, it offers the filmmakers most playful commentary on the relationship between cinema and the feminine and on his own participation in what he calls the manufacture of women, la costruzione delle donne. The organizing fiction of Intervista is that we're watching a Japanese film crew in the process of shooting a documentary on Fellini's work at Cinecita. At the same time, the maestro is supposedly involved in preparations for a new film, an adaptation of Kafka's America, for which he is attempting with difficulty to cast the role of Brunelda. He interrupts this work, however, to shoot another film in order to illustrate with the Japanese crew his own first visit to Chinachita as a young reporter on a mission to interview a glamorous fascist era diva at the end of the 1930s. The long flashback in which Fellini reinvents the memory of his first visit to Chinachita is intercut with scenes from the present tense of Intervista, allowing for an exploration of the contrast between past and present between the cheap vulgarity of contemporary Cinecita, largely dedicated to the production of television commercials and the glamorous pretensions of the film studio 50 years later, er, sorry, 50 years earlier. In the film's present tense, the maestro continues his quest for a suitable actress to fill, fill the role of Brunelda, which eventually and unexpectedly triggers in his memory the image of Anita Ekberg. Recruiting Ekberg's erstwhile co-star Mastroianni, who has shown up at Cinecita to play a magician in a television commercial, Fellini sets off with him to visit the retired actress at her home outside Rome. When the contemporary Anita Ekberg enters the scene of Intervista wrapped in a large bath sheet, she is regaled with the assurances of her great beauty and enduring charm. What we see, however, is an aging, overweight matron trying desperately to conceal her bulky form. The contrast between past and present is dramatized when Mastroianni conjures up an improvised screen in Ekberg's living room and magically projects a sequence from La Dolce Vita. Seated at Marcello's side, the teary-eyed Anita watches her performance 30 years earlier as the vivacious Silvia dancing with Marcello at a nightclub. His eyes riveted on Anita as Silvia, the aging Mastroianni, repeats the words he spoke in La Dolce Vita, re-consecrating the young woman on screen as the eternal mysterious feminine. In the present tense of Intervista, of course, he has only one query for Anita, where to find the booze, and they both repair to the kitchen to have a drink. By encapsulating both sublime and abject connotations of femininity in the figure of Anita Ekberg, Intervista suggests how the impulse to fetishize and the tendency to debase can coexist in cinematic constructions of women. Nonetheless, anxieties about aging and decay are not entirely focused on Ekberg in this film, since the issues of male aging and fragility are also present here humorously articulated in the dialogue between Marcello and Bellini himself. To an even greater degree than Intervista, Fellini's final film, The Voice of the Moon, suggests a sweepingly negative view of contemporary culture dominated by the implacable ascent of television. Highlighting the pervasiveness of mass media, the film foreshadows the exploitation of television by political and corporate interests and implicitly critiques a broad range of social and cultural phenomena that were at the time only beginning to assert themselves in Italy. The Voice of the Moon is set in the present, that is the late 80s, in a small town that seemed roughly similar in size to the one depicted in Amarcord. Whereas most residents of the town in the earlier film had embraced the ideology and rituals of fascism, the townspeople in The Voice of the Moon are obsessed instead with television and consumer culture. Evo, the film's protagonist, is a slightly deranged man-child played by Roberto Benigni, was completely at odds with the surrounding world. We find him one, <clears throat> we follow his wanderings around the town in search of the beautiful blonde Ad Aldina, who reminds him of the moon. And we're also introduced to a handful of equally eccentric characters who similarly live on the margins of society. 
ultimately the film elevates the oddity of these figures over the media saturated conformity of the supposedly sane townspeople. The town itself is a hideous hodgepodge of provincialism and modernization as the locals eagerly anticipate the opening of their own television station. In this dystopian landscape, women appear to adapt more willingly to the seductions of the contemporary world than their male counterparts. In fact, the collusion with consumerism and media culture is equated with, the, with an excess of female desire. The most obvious example of this phenomenon is Marisa, a coarser version of Gradiska in Amarcord. Marisa often appears on screen in a red suit, just like Gradiska, although she's much less likable. Through flashbacks, we learn that Marisa's husband had been unable to meet her all-consuming sexual demands, which are memorably visualized in the film through her transformation into a steam engine that overpowers and terrifies her fragile partner. The Voice of the Moon initially presents the luminous Aldina as occupying the opposite end of the feminine spectrum, where she resembles to some degree the muse figure in earlier Fellini films. Yet she soon loses her idealized aura and Evo is forced to acknowledge that Aldina is just like all other women. The film ultimately attributes to both of these figures, Marisa and Aldina, a similar level of collusion with the prevailing norm. Significantly in the film's last sequence, uh, as Ivo wanders the moonlit countryside, he sees Aldina's face projected onto the surface of the moon where she is launching a television commercial from her new vantage point in the sky. This image poignantly suggests the transformation of the moon as a time-worn locus of inspiration for poetry and myth into a fetish screen at the service of contemporary corporate interests. Although the voice of the moon presents women as more complicit in the distorted values of contemporary culture uh, than their male counterparts, they are scarcely the source of prevailing conditions. In order to remind his viewers of the powers that lurk behind the new social order, the film contains an image of media tycoon and owner of the Milan soccer club, Silvio Berlusconi, painted on a door inside a local restaurant. Though never explicitly remarked on in the film's dialogue, Berlusconi's likeness is regularly kicked in the butt by a waiter on his way in and out of the restaurant kitchen, a gesture that nonetheless would hardly hinder the unstoppable ambition of the real life Cavaliere. The world depicted in the voice of the moon with its giant video screens installed at the center of the town square and its tendency to transform all manner of events into the focus of a media frenzy may have seemed more evocative of science fiction than provincial realities when the film was released. However, thanks to the growth and consolidation of Berlusconi's political power in the years that followed, its, its contours are uncannily similar to the cultural landscape that emerged in Italy after Fellini's death. Thank you, that's it. Thank you very much, Anya. Very um, stimulating talk. We have two talks that seem quite different, but in a sense, uh, um, they're not. Considering that uh, you know the the male fantasy uh, about the feminine, which involves not only the the wife or the or the lover, but also the mother, seems inevitably to involve collapsed time. And so when you go to to Rome, there, uh, and I know that. Um, Professor Carrera has written about the maternal as a matter of fact, but when he was speaking about the collapse of time between ancient Rome and contemporary Rome, either through the worker whose figure is in the fresco or, or everything else, I was reminded of um, Freud's use of Rome as a metaphor for the unconscious in which nothing is ever erased. And so all the past is present. The way the city of Rome has layers that go back 2000 years and you find not only the, the, uh, the antique, but you find the med medieval and the Renaissance and the Baroque and it's all there. And the Romans, I have the a dubious distinction of being half Roman. I'm very proud of it myself. So I speak here from a certain uh, personal point of view. The Romans pride themselves on, on being trans historical 
and so they have expressions, you know, neo viste di tutti colori. We've seen every, we've seen that in every shade of color here. So the Roman who uh, deals with contemporary politics, morality, crises, whatever, prides him or herself on, on, on the fact that the history of that city is so uh, ancient and so contradictory that, um, that you have this kind of uh, trans historical point of view. So the, 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 the feminine, how does this play in? I agree with Anya that the, that the early Fellini, maybe all of Fellini is a projection of male fantasy. But people relate to that regardless of their gender because they understand, again, Freudianly speaking, that the fantasy of one's mother and of incest, the Oedipal complex, so to speak, is just um, universal. So the, the, the line from Freud to, to uh, Fellini is absolutely direct. And then of course you get the complications that um, Professor O'Healy was talking about once you get the television, because television does not project fantasy the way cinema, classical cinema always did in the darkened room where you have 200 people together looking at one image, you know, that great ceremonious ritual value that was given to cinema. So all of that gets bemoaned by Fellini as it um, falls apart. And with that, the fragmentation of desire so that the desires are no, long, no longer archetypical and not even necessarily male centered and so on. All of that um, comes up. So, so I'm very happy to see how these two, um, these two uh, presentations really are talking about how we as individuals, you know, are plugged into these things that are much, much broader than we are. So we have a few questions that I've, um, I've looked at here. Let me just um, choose one or two. I'll start with one by uh, Ryan Calabretta Sider about Città delle Donne, so picking up on the second talk, one of the very late films of Fellini. Ryan writes, Città delle Donne has received various criticisms due to its representation of women. Giulietta Mazina, that's Fellini's wife and the one who was in La Strada and other films, was never questioned on her thoughts on the film. Fellini himself, in an interview on a trip to the United States, was uh, ambiguous. Can we, Ryan asks, read the film as feminist? Are there feminist moments? Is Fellini a feminist, at least at moments? Anya, you want to tackle that? Okay, it's a hard question, and I kind of avoid um, talking about City Women because it's a film I can't bear to watch. <laughs> Um, but I think these questions are valid, all of them. And, you know, I, 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 I believe that in all of the films, Fellini is driven by, by fantasy and, and, and deep um, archetypal preoccupations. And, you know, he was uh, interested not only in Freud, but also in Jung. And he, he um, developed a lot of dream work that he, he spent a great deal of time elaborating. And this influenced his, his films as well. But I see City of Women kind of on a different level as um, an exasperated response to a particular development in popular culture that he found alien. And um, I think that there are many hostile misogynistic moments in the film, really difficult to watch. But I also think that he has uh, attempted seriously or whoever helped him to write the film to, to take some of the, um, of the feminist uh, writings on board because there are actually uh, quotations from French feminism, from Italian feminism. Um, this, this is a film for which some research was done and, and it's not just a, um, a casual mockery of the movement. Uh, so I, I think that that should be said in his, in, in his support, but the aggressiveness, and of course it's all mediated through, through Snaborats. It's all mediated through this male character. So we know right away that we are not being presented to these images as, as pure fact in any manner of, of thinking. So that does take the edge off the aggression. Um, but at the same time, I find it a deep, deeply disturbing film. And I, I think that Fellini may have had some elements of feminism. 
I know that um, my late colleague, uh, Marguerite Waller, strongly felt that uh, Fellini was a feminist, but I, I can't completely endorse that. I think he was very ambivalent about feminism. At best, he was ambivalent. Okay, good, thank you for that. I have a question that the two of you can answer, but we can maybe start with um, Alessandro. It's related to this question of um, collapsing time. Yes. Alessandro, you mentioned Shane Butler, who used to be a colleague of ours at UCLA, talking about our uneasiness vis-a-vis -vis antiquity and that collapsed time has something to do with understanding that the past is not easily comprehensible. One question that's come here is whether um, after Me Too, how should professors approach Fellini when teaching him, given this difference, if you will, in the projection and representation of, of the feminine that he engaged in and he gave voice to, you know, many typical attitudes of the time and, uh, and, and the situation we're in today, which would seem after Me Too, one could also mention Black Lives Matter as analogous, we educators are called upon to teach things from a very contemporary point of view. I wonder how the two of you deal with that, because I certainly have trouble in my classes. Um, well, uh, sometimes I use a, a line with my students. Uh, I tell them that basically, okay, let's make, uh, let's make a decision at the beginning of the class. Everything and everyone up to six months ago was uh, sexist, racist, misogynist, uh, and cap capitalist and colonialist. Having said that, we can go on. Um, but that's just, uh, that's just the line. Uh, the reality is that uh, the world is changing faster, is changing uh, faster than uh, it has ever changed before. And uh, therefore, we can uh, look at the past with critical eye, but also relax uh, a little, because uh, that kind of past uh, is not uh, threatening uh, us at the moment. Uh, we have uh, serious uh, threats that are absolutely present uh, together with us uh, today. So we should not be afraid of Fellini. We should not be afraid of uh, basically anyone who was honest enough to tell us uh, what he or she felt about uh, about difficult issues and and then we can uh, we can discuss them and then we can reject them of course uh, i am the first to say that i never liked the city of women i never liked city of women not even when it came out in in 1980 and uh, the funny thing is that i have some connection with that film because i know i knew a feminist who was involved in the making of that film. And she was a certified feminist and she was happy to work with Fellini. And she appears twice. Uh, her name was uh, Mary Franco Lao. She was the first uh, feminist musicologist uh, in Italy. And uh, Fellini contacted her. Uh, this is a story that I tell in, in my book because it's a story that she told me. Mm, Fellini mm, called her and said, I know that you are some kind of a witch, so why don't you do something uh, in, uh, in my film? And yeah, that's the, that was the Fellini approach, but she was not uh, offended or anything like that. She was happy to work with Fellini and she wrote the, the song that you hear the feminists sing. And this is a feminist anthem that is being translated in several languages. You know, and in the in the film, you don't hear the final line, which is the punchline, uh, and I will not repeat it here. But uh, you can find it on on the web. Uh, the the song is called uh, "Un Uomo Senza Donna." Uh, you know, um, um, uh, actually, it's uh, "Una Donna Senza Uomo," a, a woman without a man. But then it reverses and becomes uh, so. What is a woman without a man? And then in the end, it is uh, "What is a man without a woman?" and uh, the point is that a woman without a man can be anything she wants, and a man without a woman is basically a dick. Okay. Uh, and, well, you know, uh, she wrote the song for, uh, for the Fellini film. She appears uh, dressed in green because she's practicing yoga in the, in the feminist convention scene. 
And uh, a lot of that scene of the convention actually is taken from uh, what feminists in Italy were actually doing at that time. There, are, there, is a, there is a theatrical sketch that, you know, it could have been written by Franca Rame for, for what I know. But, but the film is not good. The film is not good because uh, that, that moment is particularly interesting. It's particularly well done. And then the film meanders through you know, Snaporas' dreams and dreams and dreams and dreams. And, you know, dreams are boring. Interpretation is interesting, but dreams per se are not that interesting. Not even Fellini's dreams, not even my dreams or anyone's dreams. So it's just, it wanders too long. On the other hand, to, to, to answer your question, how can we teach the past? Uh, we teach the past keeping an eye on what is, again, continuity and discontinuity. Uh, I mean, in, in my book, I gave a sort of a Foucauldian uh, reading of Fellini Satiricon. That is, Fellini, after all, was the only Italian intellectual, together with Gianni Celatti, who really took Foucault seriously. And of course, Fellini never read Foucault. Celatti did. Uh, Fellini never, never did. But uh, he is the Italian Foucault to the extent that he understood that there is a, a gap, there is a breakup between the past and modernity. And we cannot just uh, ignore it. We have to accept it fully. And the same thing, uh, it could be said, not just because modernity and antiquity now, because of Me Too, because of Black Lives Matter, but because what we are today and what we were six months ago. So there is a breakup. Yes, we have to respect it. All right. Um, Anya, would you like to tackle the question too, please? Um, about uh, teaching in the post era, is that the question? Is that well, the yeah, one? You had mentioned, um, I think you mentioned it yourself that you felt a little uneasy after Me Too or teaching uh, or, or about one of the films you didn't like to see anymore. Right, and I, I think it's it's something that I, I'm constantly trying to elaborate in my in my work as a teacher because one of the things that I try to militate against is the literal reading of any image or the literal reading of any audiovisual sequence. And I think it's all too easy to mark something as distasteful or politically incorrect at first view uh, without going through the work of contextualization. And what I try to, to, to encourage is some sort of deep reading that allows uh, students to see the broader perspective from which these images emerge rather than just blankly approaching them as dimensional um, presentations that really can be labeled as offensive in a kind of a knee jerk reaction. Um, and that's the thing I, I, I'm against because I don't think that helps us evolve at all. Um, I, I do think there are offensive images. I'm not saying that there aren't, but I, I'm saying that all images are deserving of, of some kind of reading and some kind of um, historical contextualization in order to make a criticism, criticism meaningful. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's, it's something I think about all the time. Right, no, I, I, I agree. I think you have answered my question. My brief contribution to an answer would be to remind us that uh, just like it takes two to tango, films and all artworks involve readers, spectators, and as those change, sometimes the films and the artworks don't don't um, don't change with them, and so there comes in that discontinuity rather than continuity. So even a scene that you might have laughed at in an old Italian film from the '60s, I, I teach Wertmüller all the time things that were supposed to be funny now don't appear funny because they involve either some physical action or someone's being made fun of and we're, we're more sensitive now than we used to be. So that it's a dialectical, it's an encounter of two. There's the artwork and the audience. And so, yeah, the thing is never literal, is it? Let's see, we don't have much more time. We're at 725. We've got a few questions here that, that um, I would, I would like to, to get to, but um, some of them are like, so one's about Casanova, but it's a little, it, it might take us too far afield. Maybe we can ask this one about uh, La Grande Bellezza, which is the great beauty, I think, is it called the great beauty in English? 
yes. you know, it was based much on La Dolce Vita. So here's the question by Tony Ferrar. Would like to hear some comparisons between La Dolce Vita and La Grande Bellezza, insofar as they both represent moods and energies in Italian and Western society, but of a different sort. One is decidedly darker than the other. So here we have history and time and changing uh, perspectives on the same city. Would either of you like to um, compare these two films? I know that the second one had a much success in the US as well as in the world. Alessandro, would you like to take this question? I would like, maybe I, I can answer briefly, briefly because we don't have much time. Uh, uh, the Great Beauty is uh, definitely an, an interesting film. I don't think uh, it measures up fully to La Dolce Vita because La Dolce Vita was a defining moment and The Great Beauty is an afterthought. Uh, what I found uh, interesting uh, in the movie, is, besides the technical aspect, it's very well, very well done. But um, what I found interesting was that uh, uh, we see that after all, uh, you know, uh, Marcello in La Dolce Vita was not meant to become a great writer. So maybe he was wise after all when he chose the career of a PR man because uh, he didn't have uh, what it takes <laughs> to become a serious intellectual. And uh, Jeff Gambardella in The Great Beauty wrote only one novel and then he became a gossip journalist. So he went back to what Marcello was in La Dolce Vita. And the only thing I found uh, mm, not convincing in The Great Great beauty or that made me cringe a little is when uh, in the end uh, he goes back to the memory of his uh, teenage crush uh, and decides that that will be the beginning of his great new book and uh, at the moment I thought please don't you know, please don't write that book we don't need the other Italians going back to their teenage crush please no <laughs> okay thank you Anya, would you like to add anything? Um, I don't, I know, I'm not enraptured by La Grande Bellezza, so I'd rather not say anything. It's one of those movies, it's sort of a little bit like Elena Ferrante, I found. You either love it or you hate it, you know? I mean, it's polarizing, mm. despite, you know, that it's very beautifully shot uh, and so on and so forth. But it is one of those films that's, uh, it's one of those strong statements. And I'm not saying I, I, I hate it or I love it. But um, okay, we have one more question I think we have time for. And this one is a little um, circuitous, but quite clear ultimately. Fellini was obsessed with Kafka's novel, America, writing a script based on it and even putting a filming of a Fellini film of it within the doc mock documentary Intervista. Of course, Kafka never visited America and so I wanted to ask the speakers about their thoughts about the idealized role of America, American popular culture, and the movies in Fellini's imagination. You can put Kafka's in parenthesis, but you see the point. The point is that, it, again, we're talking about projection and cinema in America that uh, Fellini makes a point of. Who wants to start? Hey. Anya, well, you want to... I don't have much to say, except I get the point about America as a projection. Um, uh, what I only found out recently in reading about Fellini is, is how enchanted he was with Disney. Um, I, I had no idea that he had actually, uh, that some of his sketches for the early films were from Disney figures. And um, he, he was, his first visit to New York uh, was in 1962, I think. And of course, the, the imagination of America and the, the, the fantasies that were projected by the films were much more about America for him than anything that he actually saw when he went there. So, um, yeah, I mean, this was true. This is true of many of the great Italian artists and, 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 and writers of the 20th century. It was certainly true of Pavese um, as well, for whom America was just this amazing country, but he never saw it. So. Um, Yes, it's a projection. Like woman, America is a projection that you can do what you want with for a lot of these European artists and intellectuals. Alessandro, I'm sure you have something. Uh, and America, America, of course, is, is Hollywood. 
to, to Fellini more than, more than anything else. And uh, the connection between uh, uh, Kafka's America and Fellini's America, I think is in the last chapter of uh, Kafka's novel, when Karl Rossmann uh, and his friend uh, Giacomo are riding on a train toward uh, the great theater of Oklahoma, which is the place where every desire will be satisfied, everybody will have a, a, a job uh, and everybody will be happy. And of course, we don't know if they reach that great theater of Oklahoma, natural, natural theater of Oklahoma is called. Well, uh, that place is Hollywood in many ways. And in fact, it's a place where Fellini never wanted to work. He always refused uh, every offer to work in Hollywood because uh, he knew that it was going to be a big disappointment, just like it was for several, for many, many European uh, directors and actors. There are very, very few that made it in Hollywood because the rules are so different. So he preferred to have it as his, I think, as his personal natural theater of Oklahoma located on the Hollywood Hills and never reaching it. Mm -hmm. Well, good. I, uh, I think this would be a good time to, um, to close, thanking the two of you. I don't know if we have um, the Italian Cultural Institute here to there give us the official goodbye, but I want to thank both of you very much. A very, very stimulating discussion and presentation. Alessandro Carrera and Anya Nahili, and I'll pass the microphone to Valeria Rumori in Los Angeles. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this enlightening conversation. Again, grazie mille to Professor Alessandro Carrera, Anya Oili, Tom Harrison, and of course, the Consul General of Italy in Houston, Federico Ciattaglia, for joining us. We invite you all, wherever you are, to follow us on our social media or visit our website to sign up for upcoming events. And you're also invited to attend our virtual exhibit and upcoming webinar celebrating the 20th edition of the Italian Language Week in the World, La Settimana della Lingua Italiana. Yesterday, we also opened the virtual exhibit organized with Romix in Italy and institutes throughout North America, drawing stories, the evolution of the Italian language in comics. The initiative will feature also live streaming presentations that are viewable on our Facebook page on October the 21st, October 23rd, and October 28th featuring major names in Italian comics discussing the art of comic creation. The Italian Culture Institute in Los Angeles will also co-present with a Consulate General of uh, Italy in Houston, the journalist and author Federico Rampini in a virtual encounter, East and West, 2,500 years of history, getting to know each other. And we succeeded on October 23rd at 4 p.m. PDD. On October 27th, Antonio Iannotta, last but not least from the University of San Diego, will also present his webinar, Italian Comics from Corriere dei Piccoli to GP. And he will explore the history of Italian comics. We do hope to see you again soon. Thank you for joining us tonight. Grazie a tutti. Buona settimana della lingua italiana. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie, thank you all. Thank you all for having us. Grazie a tutti. Okay. Buona serata. Bye.